بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وبعد welcome to the Friday حلقة at Abu Hurairah Center where we still uh, try to take some kind of a thematic approach to the Quran and we comment on the surahs and uh, we try to go um, Generally speaking, our approach is to go as brief as possible, uh, just touching on the main themes. But sometimes we do go, go into details when, when we are pulled in the details by their own gravitational power. So we, we are dealing with Surah Yunus. And uh, we said uh, Surah Yunus, as the beginning indicates, uh, that this is a book that is full of wisdom. And then it sort of delineates the response uh, that it was received with either a positive or a negative and we said some verses two verses really display the central theme in surah yunus and these are verses number uh, 56 and 57 where allah says للمؤمنين, O humans uh, there has come to you uh, a reminder an admonition from your lord and it contains healing for what is in the chests. And it also carries guidance and mercy uh, to the believers. Uh, we, we, we went over this, last, uh, I mean, a while ago, last in our last session, our last halaqa. But I want to highlight the concept of maw'idah here. Uh, and before I highlight maw'idah, I'll just read the following verse which is a continuation of this say uh, with the bounty of Allah with the blessings of Allah and his mercy let them rejoice and be happy so that's the real source of joy and happiness because any happiness that is that depends on something that is transient something that is uh, ephemeral meaning a like a temporary thing of this world it is not going to last the only valid happiness and joy comes from things that, you know, have no end. And that's basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and success in, in fulfilling uh, his, his trust. So this is what we should be happy with. And Allah says we should be happy with the Quran. The mercy here and the blessing of Allah is actually refers to the Quran, his words, his guidance. And this is what we really ought to be happy with. And this is the only source of happiness because anything else you're happy with is going to come to an end. It's short-lived and you can contemplate anything in life. Like we enjoy, let's say for example, some kind of a, um, a monetary gain, some profit. I mean, you will be happy for a few days and then you will get used to it. And when it will run away, uh, uh, oh, sorry, it will run out. And when it runs out, that's it. You, you are in search of, of another profit, another gain and so on and so forth. You buy a new car. There is an initial joy, but then eventually you just get used to it and the, the, the joy dissipates. Um, you're happy with someone. You, get, you got to know someone who is very important or famous or resourceful. You get to know them, but eventually this relationship is going to go into you know, the, 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 the average level of existence where it loses its freshness and its beauty. And it might even turn into its opposite. A lot of friendships, a lot of relationships and end up in enmity. So everything of this nature doesn't really deserve our true happiness. Yes, there is some kind of joy, but it should be proportionate to the, the thing itself. And what really deserves our happiness, the thing that deserves our ultimate happiness is this divine guidance from Allah, because it is a cause and a re it's, a, it's a path to eternal happiness. So I wanna highlight here, the word mo'idah, because this is a concept that has been not been treated well among among Muslims. Mo'idah, mo'idah is usually uh, nowadays is used as as some kind of speech that addresses our emotions. Uh, so basically, it it it's it's not about teaching knowledge specifically it's not teaching information it's not solid it's not necessarily solid knowledge it's just a, more of a reminder it's more of an awakening so it has more of a spiritual impact so there are two issues here one is that 
there are some people and people who are in the field of dawah who have adopted a style that is full of mawadah. All of it is just reminders. It's like appetizers. All the time is appetizers. And there's no solid content to what they teach. So all they want is actually getting people somehow emotional. That's the point of their speech. They, they get you emotional. They get you emotional. And this kind of approach to Mawrida is actually supposed to be balanced out with more solid knowledge. Just like the, the, the way, look at the Quran. The Quran has, it addresses the hearts and it inspires and sometimes it casts fear. So it addresses emotions in that sense. But, all, but it's also balanced out with a lot of content, solid content. There is fiqh, there is aqidah, there is depth. There is a lot of different types of, of, of knowledge in the Quran. The same thing applies to the Prophet wasallam. So there was a balance in his, in his approach. So there are people who, and more than actually what it, it, it really means in a sense, it revolves around uh, profound advice. In, in a sense, this is what it generally means. And, and advice doesn't have to be devoid of knowledge. It actually could be filled with knowledge. And this is the mawrida of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But it would be very powerful, like emotionally charged and deep, and it would hit deep and affect the heart. But it, it's, it's part of a bigger, um, a bigger package. So in this sense, there are dua who only and there are people who only take their like their, their approach to da'wah is, is is all about addressing emotions, 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 emotions all the time. And this is this is not in line with the Sunnah of the Prophet sallam. And this is going to be problematic because again, the a, a very perfect analogy here is just like you are providing someone with appetizers all the time, all the time. But there is no main course. There is no proper food. And uh, you can't do that over a long period of time. It's unhealthy. It's even it's even not good for the taste. There will come a point where you get where you will you will get get fed up with, um, with the appetizers or the sweets, and the desserts. So you need some proper food. So this is one issue that is with the concept of mawrida or wa'ad, as they say. This is a big issue and this is a big concern. And it should be, uh, and 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 it should be addressed. And we find people who take this kind of approach. This is the the all approach is about you know, affecting people's emotions. You will find them going down in level and in performance to a point where they start, where, where affecting or getting people worked up or getting people somehow feeling emotional is their ultimate goal. Regardless of whether the means is good or not. And you will find some of those people will address, for example, the concept of the death and the grave. And this was something in the, I would say in the, especially in the Muslim world, in the 1980s, 1990s, this was a big thing. Always speaking about death and about punishment in the grave and about the hellfire and about paradise. Some, actually we had some dua, that's all they do. And, uh, and, and, it, and it got to a point where, where, where people were listening to them for a long time and they were not really learning proper knowledge. It was just, a matter of, you know, getting, stirring the emotions, stirring the emotions. And, and it got to a point where they just wanted to stir people's emotions no matter what. And, and you could actually see, now just look in, in, in hindsight, uh, in, in hindsight, looking at people, looking at things backward now, you can actually see that, subhanAllah, uh, a lot of this, uh, emotional reaction from the audience or from people who were listening and watching was not actually a healthy reaction because when they were talking about death, people were fearing bad for themselves. It's not like they were taking uh, a lesson and taking heed of the concept of death and getting ready for it. No, people were feeling bad for themselves. Should they die? They were feeling scared of death. And this was not actually making them better people. There was just like their emotionality, their tears were not like, were not a reflection of them fearing Allah, but they were feeling, they were feeling pity towards themselves. Should they die? And this, in itself, in isolation, doesn't have any merit. Fear of death, 
is actually a part of understanding what life really is, that it ends up with death and it should give you the motivation to get ready for death, not feel sad for yourself, but get ready for death. Start getting yourself, getting your things together, ready ready for death and ready for the for the hereafter, and just putting, you know, putting this life where it truly belongs. That's the point. So, so that's one issue with the concept of moral. The second issue, which is on the opposite extreme, and that's we have some people who are actually in knowledge and who are uh, busy in knowledge. But <clears throat> when you talk about profound matters of, of aqidah and how you experience them, for example, the names and attributes of Allah, uh, states of the heart, and how the heart responds to the rulings of Allah, how it's affected by the names of Allah, by knowledge about the hereafter, and uh, how you know, the stations of the heart and things like that. People say, oh, these are just heart softeners. Pe some, so people say this in, in, a, in a way of belittle, but in the context of belittling this stuff as if it's, it's nothing, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pointless. It's just, and it seems that these people are having a reaction to those people who primarily just talk about, try to stir emotions. But the problem is, Issues about the heart were actually held in high esteem by our scholars from the past. So, and I've heard this a few times that people people would like some people who are involved in Dawah they would say, "Oh, this person, you know, he's giving a lecture on matters of the heart. Everyone can talk about the hearts. You know, it's it's nothing basically." Whereas the reality is, when you're talking about the most important matters, is actually in Islam, the end goal is the heart. When you talk about aqidah and you make sure you're getting the correct aqidah, you're understanding the names and attributes of Allah correctly, you're understanding the concept of tawheed, the oneness of Allah in terms of he's the only one worthy of worship. And what is haram and what are the things that could border shirk and polytheism? These are the tools for you to experience Tawheed, which is actually a matter of the heart. Experiencing Tawheed, living it, is a matter of the heart. It's an experience of the heart. And we have the Prophet وسلم, says in a hadith, Inna Allah, la ila wa wa lakin ila wa Allah does not look at uh, your, your looks, your appearances, and your wealth, your money, your possessions, but Allah looks at your hearts and at your actions. So where Allah looks primarily is at the hearts. And if you are not addressing the heart, it's possible that a lot of the knowledge that you are studying is only in the head and you're not getting the fruit of it. So it's just like someone who's learning how to drive and they're getting the driving license, but they never get to drive a car. So what's the point? Because what, what the experience of your heart is the driving experience and is the benefit you get from you know, the license and the training that you get uh, with, with regards to, to how to drive a vehicle. So you have these people on the other, op, on the other end of the spectrum who, who think that you should not be speaking about matters of the heart. Or if you happen to speak, it has to be once in a blue moon. And it's something everyone can speak regardless of their background, whether they are upon the correct aqidah or they have a good understanding of wrong, or a wrong understanding, they can speak about the heart. Not really. These people, they speak about the heart, they, will, they won't say, most likely they won't say the right things. Or at least if they say the right things, there will be a lot of inappropriate things being said. So, so to diminish and um, to reduce this concept of, of maw'idha, of the heart, as if it's nothing, as if it's insignificant, what's really good is the technical knowledge. Technical knowledge serves that. But we have, again, put the courage before the horse sometimes. So these are two issues that uh, I, I felt were, were, were important to, to, to point out. Okay, so we hear after this, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about, uh, Allah makes a comparison between those. So Allah exposes those who reject this message, this gift from Allah, this beautiful blessing from Allah, who respond to it negatively. Allah exposes them, addresses some of their arguments. And then Allah SWT compares them to those who accept it favor favorably. And these are the believers. Allah calls them in verse number 62, 
awliya Allah, the true friends, friends, clo close friends to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ala inna awliya Allah la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. Indeed, the awliya of Allah, uh, the, these close servants to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there, there should be no fear on them in terms of the future. Wa la hum yahzanun, and there is the past, there should be no sadness about the past. Because um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will recompense them for everything. Since you are under the care of Allah, Allah takes care of you. You know, the, there's nothing, there is no loss. There's no sense of, sense of loss. So, and who are, the, who are these people? Allah says, amanu wa kanu These people have believed and they have adhered to taqwa. They have lived according to taqwa. And we spoke about taqwa and what it means uh, many times. Allah says, لَهُمُ الْبُشْرَى فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ they will get the glad tidings, the good news from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life and in the hereafter. Somebody might say, how in this life? Well, they will feel that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will rejoice upon reading the words of Allah, upon connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet sallallahu as not to worry about these people who refuse the truth. And Allah even points out to uh, them, قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدَ Verse number 68, that they claimed Allah took a son to himself, or Allah had a son. Uh, Allah says, سُبْحَانَهُ هُوَ الْغَنِي Glory be to him. He's higher than that. He doesn't need that. He's, 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 he's self-sufficient. So he doesn't, the reason you have children is that because you humans are, are, are mortals. So you're going to die. And, and for the continuation of the human race, you will need children, you'll need reproduction. And also when, as a human being, if you get old, you get dependent, you can't even take care of yourself. So usually it is the younger generation, the children who takes care of their elders and their seniors. And obviously none of this applies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threatens that those who create lies about Allah, make up lies about Allah, they will not be successful. They will never, never be successful. This is verse number 69. But here at verse number 71, Allah starts uh, mentioning the story of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. Um, so we have the story of uh, Prophet Nuh and then the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam and uh, what I want to highlight some of these things because we 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 came across the I believe the uh, we had a mention of the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam Prophet Musa in general but some things are really worth highlighting here so we see for example the beginning at verse number 71 the beginning beginning of uh, the story of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam Allah says what alayhim naba'a Nuhin idh qala li qawmihi ya qawm ya qawmi in kana kabara alaykum مقامي وتذكيري بآيات الله فعلى الله توكلت فأجمعوا أمركم وشركاءكم ثم لا يكون أمركم عليكم غمة ثم قضوا إلي ولا تنظرون Beautiful challenge from Prophet Nuh alayhi salam It shows that he has a sense of courage, trust in Allah that he is not scared of, of his people because obviously they threatened to persecute him So Allah says and relate to them the new news of Prophet of Nuh when he said to his people, oh my people if my position here and my mission and my teaching, uh, my reminder of the, of the signs of Allah, if it has become too much for you to bear, then I put my trust in Allah. Get yourselves together, put your, all of your powers together and bring all of your partners, all of your helpers and supporters and you know, don't live under the stress. Deal with it, deal with me if you, if you think that's the way to go. And and do not even do not give me a, you don't have to give me even an, even a break. Uh, so he's basically saying, I put my trust in Allah. I put my trust in Allah. Do whatever you want to do. It's it's a mission that I'm not going to give up on. I'm going to fulfill it, and you know weigh up your options. Then he says, and if you turn away from that, if you turn away from my message, I have not asked for any profit from you. I don't I don't ask for a recompense from you. I don't want anything from you. I want for you. I want guidance for you. My recompense comes from Allah. And I was commanded to be the first of those who submit 
to Allah. So they obviously they disbelieved in him. And Allah says, eventually we destroyed them and we saved him along with those who have believed in the ark. Then Allah said, we, we sent off to him prophets and messengers to their people and they brought them clear signs. Yet they did not, they refused to believe. Then Allah talks about Prophet Musa السلام, and how he sent him to Fir'aun and how Fir'aun started making up lies. And again, <clears throat> Fir'aun is here, is a very, he's very good with his tongue. He's very good. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a master manipulator. He's, he's, he's a, a spin, you know, doctor as they say. So <clears throat> basically, so Musa uh, came to them with the truth. The first thing Pharaoh said, oh, this is magic. This is just tricks. It's a, it's a bunch of tricks and you're trying to, you know, mess around with us. Uh, but Musa -Islam said, no, magicians are people who deal with magic. They're not going to be successful in what they do. This is actually the truth. But then since this got a little bit exposed, uh, Fir'aun said, and his people, they said, Did you come to, you know, turn our attention away from our heritage, the heritage of our forefathers, and that you guys take the highest positions, so you become leaders, you want us to be followers of you? So what you're seeking is position and power. We're not going to believe in this. So again, you can, you can see that Fir'aun, is, is a, it was very good at playing games and uh, um, framing things in a very negative way and twisting facts and truth. And obviously this is something that uh, we see in our times as well in many ways, but it's, it's nothing new. This is something that prophets and messengers faced before and they had to deal with it. Uh, and then Pharaoh, obviously he resorted to the biggest challenge and he said, okay, if what... Because uh, uh, Musa alayhi salam came with miracles, and for Aum claim that these were uh, acts of magic, you know, we have better magic. Let's make a show in front of everyone and let's make a display, and we are going to show that you are actually, you know, we have better magic than you. We're more resourceful than you are. And again, this is the arrogance of Pharaoh blinded him because he knew that his magicians could not do something similar to what Musa alayhi salam came with. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed them, exposed their, uh, you know, their magic. And we know that the magicians actually believed in Prophet Musa alayhi salam. And it was a bunch of people, not too many. Allah says, Who truly believed with Musa alayhi salam was a small number of his own people. And with so much fear, and they were scared for, for their lives. Uh, because Pharaoh could, uh, you know, they, they were scared of Pharaoh and his and his uh, his uh, supporters and helpers. And obviously, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, protected them. And eventually, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala told Musa alayhi salam and his people to escape. And we know the story, and we will come, inshallah, to more details where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala split the uh, Red Sea, or uh, the Sea or the Red Sea probably, yeah, open for Musa alayhi salam and his people so they could pass uh, or walk through it. And when Fir'aun followed them, it actually the sea devoured him. And as, as he was actually dying, drowning, he said, أَمَنْتُ لَا, uh, أَمَنْتُ, uh, He said, He said, He said, I now believe there is no one to be worshipped but the one that Bani Israel believed in. He didn't even want to say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But apparently this is his arrogance even at that moment where everyone could actually believe. Uh, and again, so at the moment of death, when a person's life is already, like, it's, it's obvious, like, uh, or let's say their soul has reached their throat, there is no tawbah. There is no tawbah because at that moment, it's, it's like a bridge between this life and the unseen. The pe person has already had access to the unseen, so they see the truth. And belief should be before that point. So Allah said to Fir'aun, we shall uh, you know, keep your body intact so that you become a sign for those who come after you. It is said, and I'm not sure if this is actually true, that there is the body of Fir'aun 
in the museums in Egypt. Is it this same Fir'aun or not? Possibly the verse seems to be showing, because Allah says, verse number 92, Today we save your body, only your body, so that you remain as a sign for those who will be uh, who are after you and this doesn't necessarily include us it's again it, it doesn't specify who will come after the pharaoh is it those who remain alive of his own people at that time who, who uh, or is it even subsequent generations so again i'm personally i'm not I, I don't have a confirmation about that so it's possible but again we can't i believe we can't say 100 percent this is him Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, verse number 98, Allah talks, and this is where the surah takes its name, Prophet Yunus, Jonah, alayhi salam. فَلَوْلَا كَانَتْ قَرِيَةٌ آمَنَتْ فَنَفَعَهَا إِيمَانُهَا إِلَّا قَوْمَ يُونُسْ لَمَّا آمَنُوا كَشَفْنَا عَنْهُمْ عَذَابَ الْخِزِي فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَمَتَّعْنَاهُمْ إِلَى حين. Allah says, and there had hardly been any uh, village or city that believed and benefited, was saved by its belief, except for uh, the people of Yunus alayhi salam, when they believed we uh, eliminated the punishment, because there was a punishment on its way coming to them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eliminated it. And Allah clarifies here verse number 99, a very important, very important point with regards to Al-Qadr. Allah says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَآمَنَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كُلُّهُمْ جَمِيعًا أَفَأَنْتَ تُكْرِهُ النَّاسَ حَتَّى يَكُونُوا مُؤْمِنِينَ had, had Allah willed so, he would have guided or made all, he would have, he would have made all people on earth become believers. So do you want to force people into belief? And what that means, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us choice, free will in that sense, in that specific area, to believe or not to believe. And Allah left that to us. And that's a miracle in its own right. Um, so Allah allows us to choose what to do. And, and that's the reality of uh, uh, that's the reality of, of, of us. So so this is why you cannot guide anyone. You cannot guide anyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows the reality of people to reveal itself. And this is what this life is is about but again all of this is within the framework that Allah is has the ultimate will so no one can be guided without the will of Allah and no one can be misguided obviously without the will of Allah because he is in charge of everything and again at the end Allah subhanahu wa concludes the surah with, with just having arguments to those who disbelieve and eventually Allah closes the surah with the same, almost the same notion, but he puts it slightly differently. So verse number 108, Allah says, O oh, humans, the truth has come to you from your Lord. Oh, humanity, O oh, humans, the truth has come to you from your Lord. Whoever is guided, then you are guided for yourself. You're going to reap the fruits of that. And whoever chooses misguidance, then they'll have to deal with the consequences of this. And say, oh Muhammad, that I am not in charge of you. I'm not someone who has any, can, can you know, have exercise any control over your hearts. And follow what is revealed to you from your Lord and be patient until Allah brings his judgment and he is the best of judges. So again, so it's the truth. Allah says the truth has come to you from your Lord. And this in the middle of the surah was called Maw'idah. And at the <clears throat> beginning of the surah, Allah mentions this, uh, mentioned or referred to it as Al-Kitab Al-Hakim. Tilki ayatu Al-Kitab Al-Hakim. These are the signs of the book or the verses of the book that is wise, that contains wisdom. So we can see the surah is all about uh, the Quran being guidance, being a reminder, <clears throat> an admonition, being full of wisdom and being the truth. And that guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave people this free will to choose guidance or misguidance. 
And um, so that's the sort of circle or circle of freedom that Allah gave humans, essentially. Um, and, and Allah gave examples of uh, prophets like Nuh and Musa السلام, and how their people responded negatively, disbelieved. But Allah gave the opposite example of a people, almost a complete city that actually believed in the prophet after having disbelieved in him. Uh, the people of Prophet Yunus السلام, because eventually, because first he gave them da'wah and uh, he advised them, but they did, they did not accept that. So he felt... You know, they were not going to respond and that his message was rejected, his mission was rejected. So he left and he left without Allah SWT giving him instructions to give up on them. So he left and he was riding the sea. So he was on a ship and uh, storms came and, and it was uh, very bad weather and they, they felt, you know, the ship was going to drown. So they, they decided to throw their luggage off the ship so that so maybe the weight would they if they lighten the weight of the ship this would uh, you know limit the 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 potential or this the possibility of it drowning but again the the uh, the the crew on the ship they realized well that's not enough probably it doesn't seem and again there are conflicting views as to what to, as to what this means some of them said we need to get rid of one person uh, and and somebody some of them said no it seems that this is a punishment from Allah and there is someone who's actually committed something and what we are going through is actually a punishment so this person needs to we need to get this person off the ship and obviously no one confessed and then they sort of cast the lots and it came on Yunus alayhi salam and came on Yunus alayhi salam. Many times they, they felt shy, you know, because they, they, they held him in high esteem. But eventually he, you know, jumped out of the, he jumped off the ship and he was swallowed by a whale. Now somebody might say, you know, if you're swallowed by a whale, you can't live. Well, again, here we're dealing with a miracle. <laughs> That's just a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the one who created the whale in this way could allow you know someone to survive in the uh, in the belly of the whale, um, and uh, and obviously because he was someone who was constant constantly remembering Allah, making tasbih, and he would say La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-dhalimin, and this is a dua that the Prophet ﷺ said, anyone who makes this dua when they are in hardship, Allah would uh, get them out of 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 their predicament. Uh, but again, the point here about Yunus alayhi salam that he was always among those who used to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah caused the, the, the whale to throw him on the shore. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused uh, some kind of a pl plant, uh, maybe some sort of, a, uh, I believe, some, some sort of pumpkin or squash kind of plant. Uh, to grow where he could eat from it. Um, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, actually, oh, the, this is the narration, uh, I believe the hadith, where his people actually, after he left, his people felt really bad and they thought, they gave it a second thought and they decided to believe, so they started looking for him. They wanted to accept his message. So, Eventually, Allah brought him back to them and they believed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them from the punishment because the punishment was on its way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, halted it uh, because they believed in Yunus alayhi salam. So this is this, again, the story or the thematic commentary on Surah uh, Yunus. And this is the reason it was called prophet uh, named after prophet yunus alayhi salam next inshallah next uh, halaqa we will be dealing with surah hud bi idnillah ta'ala jazakumullah khairan for joining us and i hope that you managed to you know glean some benefit from today's uh, halaqa and uh, see you inshallah next uh, halaqa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in